kind of conspiracy involving the Soviet Union. And uh, that was such a horrible thing to try to think of. If they could miscalculate in that kind of a way, uh, Doomsday was pretty darn close. President Johnson informed Chief Justice Earl Warren that the CIA had directed explosive information to him from the Mexico City offices, the offices headed by David Atlee Phillips. The president said the CIA had pictures and tape recordings of Lee Harvey Oswald talking to the Russian agent in charge of assassinations two months before President Kennedy was killed, and only a man of Earl Warren's integrity could prevent doomsday. So after the meeting, after Bob initially saying no 30 times, Chief Justice Warren comes out of the Oval Room with tears running down his face. And for reasons uh, which I think were probably essentially altruistic, has regarded to head an investigation in which he knows the result has to be, uh, in one way or another, has to be false. On November 29, 1963, Seven days after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, the Warren Commission was established. One of the first appointed by President Johnson to the seven-man panel was Alan W. Dulles, former CIA director, fired by President Kennedy after the Bay of Pigs. Katzenbach had his way. There were no public hearings. There, was, there were hearings behind closed doors. This is the most amazing thing. If, if today, Someone, or even at that time, someone wanted, some judge said, this is a story about an abused child who was sexually abused or some other salacious rape case or something. I don't want this to be public. The ACLU would be knocking on the federal courthouse with an injunction on behalf of CBS, the New York Times, the Washington Post. We have a right to know, et cetera. This is the investigation, hearings into the death of the President of the United States. There was not an editorial in the New York Times or the Washington Post or any other newspaper in America for nine months as the hearings went on, saying, open the door. This is the investigation, hearings into the death of the President of the United States. There was not an editorial in the New York Times or the Washington Post or any other newspaper in America for nine months as the hearings went on, saying, open the door, let the American people in. In the Commission's very first session, they had to cope with the unsettling public news revealed by Dallas Assistant District Attorney Bill Alexander and reported in the Houston Post that Oswald was a stool pigeon for the FBI. In Oswald's phone book at the time of his arrest, he had the name, phone number, and license number of Dallas FBI agent James Hostie. The page with Hostie's phone number was torn out when the FBI turned Oswald's phone book over to the commission. The commission asked Hoover if Oswald was ever an informant for the bureau. Hoover said no. The commission accepted the director's word. Well, something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street. Stand by just a moment, please. Put me on, Phil. The Warren Commission and his staff had two major problems to resolve in commencing its investigation. One was the president was killed by a shot to the head. X-rays and photographs of the president's head wounds were available to the commission. The commission instead chose to look at drawings. Do you have no description of that head wound, which is fatal, in the five volumes of the FBI report? Cows will jump over the moon before you'll find it in the Warren report. This FBI document shows that the FBI had two agents present at all times at the Kennedy autopsy, who were also offered the x-rays and photographs. The FBI refused them. Can you imagine anything more important in trying to solve a crime than the autopsy? The uh, handling of the autopsy by the government indicates deception from the outset. The burning of the notes by Commander Humes. He burned it in the fireplace. No questions were asked. The word was given clearly to Commander Humes of the results they wanted. And one of the results they had to obtain for the government position to stand up was that the shot came from the back. Scores of eyewitnesses who said the president was shot from the front were either ignored or badgered. 
Jack Ruby told Earl Warren and Gerald Ford he wanted to tell the truth and asked to be taken to Washington because he feared for his life in Dallas. His offer to talk was rejected. The world will never know the true facts of what occurred, my motives. The people had, that had so much to gain and had such a material motive for putting me in a position I'm in. We'll never let the true facts come of our board to the, to the world. Now, these people are in <clears throat> very high positions, Jack. Yes. He's been shot. Shot rang up. And even in death, Lee Harvey Oswald was denied an attorney. Mark Lane had been John Kennedy's New York City campaign manager in 1960. Shocked by the shoddy handling of Lee Harvey Oswald and the evidence by the authorities in Dallas, Mark Lane, at his own expense, flew to Texas and questioned witnesses and experts and wrote an article about what he found. I called Carrie McWilliams, who was the editor of Nation magazine, and I said, Carrie, I have something now I want you to publish. She said, great. About the housing problem, about drug addiction, I said, no, about the Kennedy assassination. Don't bring it over. I don't want to look at it. I said, I'd just like you to look. Don't look, don't, no, don't bring it over. And he hung up. And that was the response I got throughout the United States. I went to see Jimmy Wexler, good friend of mine, editor of the New York Post. And uh, he said, don't publish it. I said, well, the National Guardian he said they, they would publish it. He said, no, don't. No, don't publish it anywhere. You can't get it published in any respectable publication. Don't give it to them. I said, what should I do, burn it? He said, yes. So I took it to the National Guardian. They published it. It was an editorial in the New York Post by Jimmy Wexler, my friend, which said, why did he take it there when anyone in America could have published it? Why did he start on the left? Oswald's mother saw the article and asked Mark to represent her dead son. All I want to do is write an article. That's all I wanted to do 28 years ago, was write this one article about the matter, and I thought that that would be, relieve me of my responsibility. But I met with her, and she said, I read your article. Will you go before the Warren Commission and see to it that he gets a fair shake? And I said, yes. And uh, I said, but listen, uh, I can't really be, you can't really be my client. Because if I find out that he did it, I want to feel free to say that. She said, do it. I'll write it down. He didn't do it. He worked for American intelligence. They sent him to do various things, but he would not kill the president. He would never do that. Uh, and so she signed a document saying I could conduct my own investigation and I could reveal whatever it is I want to reveal. Mark Lane was originally invited by the commission to appear as Oswald's counsel then changed his mind. They called me as a witness. I guess because they found out I wasn't in Dealey Plaza on November 22nd, 1963, therefore I was eligible to testify before them. And what they were trying to do was to get me to tell them everything that I knew. And I said, but I'm here as a lawyer, not as a witness. I wasn't there. I can tell you what people said, but I want to present witnesses. They said no. I am convinced beyond any question of a doubt that the first shot that was fired did not hit me. Then I was hit. The official government position was that Lee Harvey Oswald had fired only three bullets in 5.6 seconds from the sixth floor of the depository. One of the bullets, according to these commission drawings, hit the president in the head. Another missed and hit James Tagg standing below the triple underpass. This meant that for the government's three-shot position to stand up, one bullet, Commission Exhibit 399, had to have gone through both President Kennedy and Governor John Connolly. This almost intact bullet, one that ballistically matched Oswald's Manlicker Carcano, was accidentally found in a stretcher at Parkland Hospital. You might have among the the shooters, uh, some individuals who were unsophisticated in their other talents, and remember to say the shooting, which appears to be the case. But in Jack Ruby, uh, they had a triple hat man, and one of the functions I'm satisfied was dropping that pristine bullet, number 399, if I recall, under the right stretcher. Jack Ruby denied to the Warren Commission that on the day of the assassination, he was in either Parkland Hospital or Dealey Plaza. Although two reputable eyewitnesses told the commission they saw Ruby in Parkland, and although a Willis photograph shows Ruby in Dealey Plaza, the commission accepted Ruby's denial. 
If one shot, the commission knew, had missed altogether and the other hit the president in the head, it meant in order for the commission's case against Oswald to hold up, this one magic bullet had to cause the president's neck wound and all the wounds to Governor Connolly. Garrison said that in proving this magic bullet theory developed by Arlen Specter, the commission came up with some of its most creative drawings. This is the commission drawing which explains, according to the government, how Exhibit 399 did all the damage. The bullet, according to the commission's drawings, went through the president's neck without striking a bone, deflected, then entered into Connolly's back, smashing four inches of his fifth rib, came out under his right nipple, deflected down, demolishing the large bones in his right wrist, then deflected left, embedding in his left thigh. It stayed there until it got to Parkland Hospital, where it fell out onto a stretcher intact.